Yes, I did say three. We are starting a new chapter this morning. We have we have spent uh, uh, we have started the last couple weeks, um, uh, finished last week, I should say, chapter two, and talking about you know in chapter two this idea of of the church, right? That's really what Paul has been talking about and explaining, and so it's taken us some time, uh, really, to, to work through it. Um, you know. Remember the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, and you know, expounding on that and unpacking um, what that looks like, and, and really that that enmity, that hostility that was there. Remember that wall has now been torn down. There is no more hostility between the two groups. And why not? Why, why is that? How is it possible for two people groups or for two people in general, um, you know, to, to be at enmity and to be against each other, but yet now, you know, come together? and to be um, friends, you know, and to be brothers and sisters, and like I said, fellow heirs, really, I guess they're just not Marines. How is it possible that these things happen, that enemies can be made allies? How does that happen?
we are this couple. And uh, Lord, that we would just be a light for you and our families and, and this community and this, and this world. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so again, he's been expounding on this union of the Jew and Gentile and Christ and, and what that looks like that we, start, that we unpacked a moment ago. And now <clears throat> he makes mention here of this, this special call uh, of Paul to serve the Gentiles. Uh, and what he refers to here in verse 2, if you see that, of the stewardship of God's grace. So, um, first, though, look in verse 1. He makes mention there, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. So, what does that remind us of? That should remind us of the context of Paul's life when he writes this letter, right? So, remember what's happening there? Somebody refresh our memories. What's going on in Paul's life right now? At this time? Yeah. He's in prison in, uh, in, in uh, Rome, mm -hmm. and he's uh, he's being uh, he's uh, what do you call house arrest? Good. So he's preaching to the guards and everybody. He's Good. Free. Yep. Is that is that an, it's almost like an open door? Yeah. To get visitors and all that. So he's and God to told him he was going to go to Rome. You know, I, he told him <coughs> he's going to send him to Rome, and he just didn't know how that would look like. What that would look like, I guess, probably, but. <clears throat> um, so he did, yeah, he went to Rome, and this is where the book of Acts ends, is where he is uh, able to rent and stay in a, a house for two years, uh, still with Roman guards, still you know, waiting trial uh, to be heard by Caesar, uh, who was actually Emperor Nero at that time. And so um, that's where he was. And so things would get different and more difficult later in Paul's life. Uh, you know, and his second imprisonment would be a real imprisonment in a dungeon or in a hole in the ground. Uh, and then you know he would die uh, from that from that imprisonment. They would they would take him out, and he was uh, killed by Nero after that. But this is uh, he was crucified. Uh, Paul was beheaded because yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a Roman citizen. They would get him crucified. Roman yeah. Did you say this? This is the first time he was in jail in Rome for him. Yeah, this is the first one in Rome. Right. Yeah, like I said, so he's been in prison before. Yeah, we've seen an Acts earlier in Acts. Remember Paul and Silas there. were in jail, right, singing. Actually, look over at chapter 4, verse 1. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord. Um, you know, so making reference of that. But also, a cool reference, too, that yes, while he was a prisoner of, of you know, Rome at that time, it doesn't say, he doesn't say there or in verse 1 of chapter 4, prisoner of Rome. What does he say right there? Prisoner of, God. Prisoner of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Uh, and so I think that's pretty significant, you know, not to just uh, pass over it to say, um, you know, I am, I am the Lord's, and I, I, I do what he wants. And just, you know, maybe think of it in the same sense of, you know, he is the master and we are the servant. And, and you know, that, uh, uh, and not even servant, really, it's doulos, we are the slave. Because uh, remember the difference between rights of slaves and servants. The slave has no rights of their own, but serves only their master. Uh, and so, just a, a cool thing there, I think, to point out to see. It says he's a prisoner. He says he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus, you know, or a servant or a slave of Christ, which he says that in many other places too. I'm a slave of Christ. I'm a slave of Christ. So that's a very cool thing. But the stewardship of grace here, <clears throat> I want to talk about that for a moment. What, what does that mean? What is the stewardship of God's grace? So, God has given us, at least to him, God has given him something special. Part of it. He's part of the mystery, mm -hmm. but you know, a stewardship of grace. I mean, that <coughs> when something, when somebody gives you something like that, when you're a steward of something, I mean that you are diligently and you're you're you're, you're making sure that that grace is going evenly, or you know, what I'm saying you're right. I mean, your stewardship, the stewardship means that you're taking care of something that was given. Okay, you. good. Yeah, stewardship, and that's that's a significant thing. Um, I don't want to go down a huge rabbit trail here, but. <clears throat> just because we have, um, you know, uh, different churches, you know, teach different doctrinal distinctives and have different ideas of things, um, you know, and we've talked about this a lot in our eschatology, we've talked about this a lot just in general, and so I know there's going to be questions afterwards or maybe even right now, so I want to address this one real quick to say, um, in verse 2 there where it says the stewardship of God's grace, the King James Version says uh, the dispensation of so uh, many will take that to mean, oh, see, Paul says it's the distance. 
dispensation uh, of grace. And so um, there's this teaching or idea that you guys have heard me for years teach about, you know, through different studies of dispensationalism. That's what we're going to talk about right now. Um, so dispensationalism. Um, what is dispensationalism, as anybody can remember or knows or can recall any of that? Um, why do I bring this up quickly? Because the word dispensation is used there in the King James Version, a couple other versions. But, um, you know, this idea of dispensations. Does anybody know what we're talking about? Or dispensationalism? That's kind of like spreading out the gospel. Dispensing would be, and that would, that's a good idea, you know, a good thought. Um, did you say something, guys? Same thing. Okay. I'm just yeah. breaking the word down if you guys can have it really. Yeah, it's good. Hey, it's, that's what we're here to do. Um, so dispensationalism uh, is a, a construct or a system, it's systematic theology, essentially. How, how we put the Bible together, how we build our theology. Typically, uh, there's dispensationalism or there's covenantalism. So you have dispensations or you have covenants. Um, and we preached about this, it's been a while, uh, but just again, because we want to, to talk about you know, what we believe and why we believe. And so we want to understand there are different beliefs and different thoughts out there. And so we would ascribe more to uh, covenant theology versus dispensational theology. Dispensations means, or dispensationalism means, there are different dispensations, meaning times. And in different times, God related to people in different ways. Uh, and so, which is true, right? We talked about this progressive revelation a lot about how God spoke to the prophets, right? And chose the apostles. Now, how does God speak to us today? Through his son. Good, through his son, right? Through the word, through the spirit. But uh, typically, they'll have seven dispensations, and we'll talk about these things and that there was works and there's grace and there's these different times and they would say that we now live in the dispensation of grace and, and so they'll contrast that and here's what I want you to understand the big the big thing to, to understand about dispensationalism is generally dispensationalists uh, they hold to the view of the pre-tribulation seeker rapture thing okay so the majority of the churches are dispensational churches now uh, that's changed that's change over, you know, since the early 1800s, now things have changed. So they hold to this idea because they think Israel and the church, God has different plans for Israel and the church, and there's kind of a distinction between Israel and the church, and so we don't ascribe to that. Uh, you know, we don't think there's a distinction to a certain fact of, of uh, you know, end time implications, but also certainly not to salvation, because the point is, how do we believe Old Covenant, New Covenant? How are people saved? By faith, right? By faith alone. And so a lot of people in dispensationalism have different ideas about what that looks like, and they may even tend to lean towards uh, different methods of salvation, which you know, is certainly not the church. But now there are dispensationalists that say everyone's saved by faith, but they have these different ideas about dispensations and times. And I bring that up because they use this verse to say, see, Paul talks about him having a dispensation of grace, meaning that he's living in the time of grace. The problem with that is that even in the King James Version, this word that's used here, um, this Greek word that we translate here, uh, did you read from the ESV? Yes. Okay, it says stewardship. I have a NASB, it says stewardship. Um, so the King James says dispensation. But that word in the King James is used seven times. And four times it's translated dispensation. But three times it's translated as stewardship, which is what the NASB transfer, translates that, which is what the ESV translates as. And here's other, uh, these other words here, same, same word is translated as administration or management or stewardship. So the idea behind this word is like you were saying, a steward, what does a steward do? What is stewardship? We hear ideas and teachings about stewardship in the Bible, right? That we're called to be good stewards. What does that mean? Steward not just to uh, take care of something. Yeah. Okay. Even, you, something. even in, the, in, in the union, there's a stewardship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 If they're doing a job, they, they take care of everything. You need to get a job. It's a good. Yeah, good. 
we, we here in the church, um, and certainly when I say we, it is collectively the body here, but you know, even with the pastors, you know, I have a greater accountability even for the stewardship of you know, what God gives us here, right? We're called to be good stewards of the things he's blessed us with. You're called to be a good steward of your family and of your finances and of the things that God has blessed you with. Uh, your manager, your administrator. See it? So the idea here is not that, that they're speaking, that Paul's saying, oh, let me tell you a little bit about this difference in the that we're now in the dispensation of grace versus the dispensation of the law, for instance. He's not saying we're no longer in the time of the law. We're now in the time of grace. He's saying God has called me to be a steward of his grace. You see the context here? It's management. It's stewardship. Um, and so that's the context, and that's why I ask, what is stewardship? Because he says, look at the rest of that verse, verse 2. The stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you. So this stewardship, what is it that he's talking about? And he says it was given to me for you. For who? For the Gentiles, he's saying. Okay. Those who would those who would hear him and believe. Okay. Yeah, I'd say both are the same, so right? He said mystery is right Yeah, mystery. both both are the same. Because the Gentiles are already expounding on the Gentiles coming into this this right. thing, revealing this mystery, and, and that is what uh, what Sky is alluding to, that the stewardship is of the gospel, right? The stewardship, we are called, aren't we? So so to some degree, aren't we all stewards of the gospel? Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, I think of 2 Corinthians where Paul says, um, you know, that we're called to be ambassadors for Christ, right? We're stewards of the gospel. We're ambassadors for Christ. Uh, we are prisoners, right, of Christ. We're slaves of Christ, of righteousness. And so, um, you know, this is the stewardship that he says uh, he has. And uh, then it says, you know, by revelation, next verse, verse 3, by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. So the question, a couple questions. The revelation of the mystery was made known to him. So let's talk about how was it made known to him, what is the mystery, and when did he speak of it briefly before? Uh, we can take those in any order we want. What, who revealed this mystery to you? Christ himself. Right? Good. I don't know if it's the Lord, right? The Lord. But God, right, is the ultimate answer. Because yeah. what is the mystery? That, and and we'll, we can expound and definitely spend some time unpacking that here in a moment. Uh, but first, so let's go to that one last thing. When did he speak of this mystery? Well, look back at chapter 1. Because he's writing to the church at Ephesus here. Now, had Ephesus maybe heard of or, or had any of his other letters you know, circulated and writ, uh, read to them? Possibly. But they're now reading and listening to this letter. So as he says later in the letter, oh, this is, you know, this is what I'm talking about that I mentioned earlier. Remember, they weren't teaching and taking whatever it's been, eight, nine months to get to this verse. Somebody's reading this letter to them, you know what I mean, like, like a pastor, standing up here and reading this letter. This, here's a letter from a brother Paul, and, and they read it, and so it's, it's you know reading this all in one take and, and context, and it certainly would have broken up and studied it more, but remember, they would, they would recall this maybe you know, quicker than we will, because it's been a long time since we were in chapter one. Um, look at verses 9 and 10. He's talking here about, uh, you know, to the praise of God's glory and grace. Remember that he adopted us as children. He lavished this grace upon us. And in verse 9, it says, He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. So he's talking here about the mystery. See it? And what does he say there is the mystery? Or what does he say even in chapter 3 is the mystery? Because when you think of a mystery, guys, I think we typically tend to think of like maybe a mystery novel. Maybe when you're growing up, when I grew up, when I was a kid, I used to read those um, Hardy Boys books. I don't know if any of y'all remember yeah. those. But there's like these mystery books, or you watch a, a 
you know, mystery show, maybe you're into those types of movies and stuff, and you're trying to figure out the plot twist at the end, and what's the mystery, who done it, and, you know, how did this happen? That's what we tend to think of when we think of a mystery, that it's something, it's a puzzle, right, that we're trying to put together and figure out. But the difference in this mystery is, this is a mystery that man cannot put together and understand. It's God's will. Okay. Do, do we understand this? This is a mystery that without divine intervention, we cannot put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. That God to has it. to put pieces of this puzzle in place for you and show it to you like, oh, you know, like when you put a, piece, a puzzle together and you're like, oh, look, it's a clown, you know what I mean, or, or whatever. God is the one who has to put the puzzle together for us and reveal this mystery to us. So understand, Paul's not saying, oh, this is a mystery and I'm, I'm confounded here and I have no idea what it is and neither do you. No, he's saying to us, what? What is this mystery? What is it? That the Gentiles will be grafted into Okay, yeah, and it says that, uh, you know, down in verse 6, to be specific, that this is the, the mystery. So, that they're brought in and grafted into what? What is that talking about? Salvation. Eternal life after death, like the question of what happens when you die, you know, you okay. start again, you know, yeah. you live another life, you know, all the things that yeah. all these other religions have come up with, and then there's some ideas, well, this is the, the yeah, so this is what it is. I'm yeah. telling you what Here's, it is. Like so the answer is. You're also going to be with you, everybody together. We're all, you're all here. Good. Well, yeah. Good. So the, the mystery is the good news, right? Which yeah. is what? Good news gospel. is gospel. Right. The mystery is the gospel uh, that it has been revealed. And so, um, and, we, and we'll get more into that in a minute. Because first, let's start with he says. By revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. So it is still a mystery, right? Because who is it a mystery to? Everybody that the Lord has revealed to. Good. Everyone who is in sin and in darkness, who was everyone who's ever been born, who was me, who was you, who is everyone. And so without the revelation being revealed to you, you're still, it's still a mystery to you. Right? Makes sense? Like you were just saying. Religion and all the things that people are searching for are trying to say, how do you get to heaven? Is there a God? How do I know him? How do I please him? That's all a mystery. And that's why I think we see religion and mankind trying to appease God. Right? We're trying to figure it out. Because it's mysterious and we don't know. And until God reveals it, that's what happens. And that's Romans 1 and 2. That we worship the creation over the creator. That we make God who we want to be God. And we make our own rules about who he is. Uh, it, does that make sense that how this thing is happening? It is, a, it is mysterious to those. Uh, but, Paul says, it's no longer a mystery to him because it was revealed to him. So turn over, please, to Acts chapter 22 um, to say, when was it revealed then to Paul? So let's look back at this. And, and at first, you go back to chapter 9. That's... Saul's conversion, um, but he's going to refer to that here in chapter 22. So I want us to, to go in here and we'll spend the rest of our time just, uh, you know, unpacking this in Paul's life and get some application of Lord willing out of this real quick. <coughs> Man, excuse me. And um, and then, you know, you guys give us some thoughts and insight and some application here after we get through these verses. So the context here is it's after Paul has been converted. He's been on the three mission journeys that we have um, on record in Acts. He is now standing before the Jews because he has sailed uh, back to be in Jerusalem at the end of his third trip and uh, for, for Pentecost, I believe it was. And he is being accused by the Jews uh, to go, go into the temple and bringing um, a Gentile in there. They're, they're beating him. They're bringing him out to, to stone him and to kill him. And a Roman uh, cohort, a Roman soldier, intervenes and takes him into custody to figure out why is everybody trying to kill you. And so now um, Paul is uh, up on the stairs and he asks this uh, guard to let him speak to these people who are just trying to kill him. 
Okay, and so from here in chapter 22, he's then going to be taken before the next morning. He's taken before the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin uh, to be tried by them. And they want to kill him because, remember, the Jews all hate Paul now, right? Why do they hate Paul now at this point? He left um, his preaching Christ. Basically. Yeah, because he was a Pharisee, he turned on them and is now, you know, the chief ambassador for Christ, for the one that, that he was persecuting and for the one that they wanted him to persecute. So now he's switched teams. He's a traitor. See that to the Jews. The Jews hate him. And so uh, that's when we're leading up to the end of Acts here where he's going to be in Rome to where he's writing the letter of Ephesians. Okay, so here in chapter 22, um, let's read from verse 3. He's talking to these brothers these and sisters these of, you know, understand ethnically. He's speaking to the Jews. And uh, and who, who can read for us maybe uh, 3 to 21? Let's start, let's start with that. Jason, you got that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of <laughs> Gamaliel? Yeah. <laughs> According to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to death. Oh, pause there. That's significant. Uh, I don't know, depending on what version you have there, but uh, does way have a cup, capital W? Yeah. Yeah. You guys Bibles? Okay. I persecuted this way. Uh, that is Christ. That is the gospel. Uh, in, in Acts, you'll you'll find that earlier too when he talks about you know I was persecuting the church, uh, you know on the on the road to Damascus and all that, um, and and taking those who were of the way and throwing them them into prison. The way. Uh, think of John 14, 6, right? What does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, it's not till uh, I think it's in Antioch, uh, it says that, that uh, they were first called Christians. The early movement here of what we call the church of Christianity in, in the book of Acts was called the way. That's what they called it. So he was going to persecute the followers of the way. Okay, so and so that's Jesus. Okay, so just understand, when you see that capital W, we're talking some gospel, we're talking about Christ, He's talking about the church. I persecuted this way to death, not giving deliverance to prison, but commended the sentence as a high priest and <clears throat> full council of elders and granted the rest. From them I received letters to the brothers and I sent them toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way to the nearest Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. So what is happening right now? What's what's he doing? Yeah, he's recapping, right? He's giving his testimony. That's what he's doing here, up in front of the Jews. Yep, I was Jew just like y'all. I was persecuted the way. I was with you and zealous for God. And then here's what happened. Okay, thank you. So this is a recap of his testimony from chapter nine. I was on my way to the nearest Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you? I'm so sorry, but you can't pass that. That's such an awesome thing, dude. Look at what he says. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So who is it speaking to him? Jesus. Right. And, and right, the way Jesus. And, and at that point, where was Jesus? In heaven, right? Ascended in heaven. He appears to, to Paul. And so Paul, was Paul persecuting Jesus? Yes. Well, yes and no, right? Because he wasn't, because Jesus was in heaven. But that's what I want you to catch. When he says, Saul, so why are you persecuting me? Who's he talking about? The church. So understand, who was Saul trying to throw in prison? Believers. Who was the Saul? The Holy Spirit, too. Huh? The Holy Spirit was into all of them. Yeah. And he was throwing them in a jail. He was condoning their deaths and, and wanting to persecute them. So I just think it's a significant thing for us to understand that Jesus here, God's word says, when somebody's persecuting the church, they're persecuting Jesus. Yeah, that's big. You see that? That's a big aha uh -huh thing. And that's good. <laughs> you go back to what he said, I will build my church. Mm -hmm. So it's him. We are with him, right? We are co-heirs. And what happens to us is, you know, he, he heals. He is with us. And that's a big deal. Why are you persecuting? Because he could totally say, I don't even know who you are. I'm not persecuting you. He's persecuting the church, which is Christ. Remember, Christ.
Christ is the head and we are what? We're the body. So, here's the story, right? Here's, we're back in Ephesians, and that'll be, that'll be where we stop for today. We've we got four minutes. And it says, the revelation was made known to me, Paul. There's our account of when it was made known to him. And then he goes on after that to say about what he did, uh, that he, he left Jerusalem, right? Because uh, he, he was saying, they're not going to listen to me, Lord. Like, they know who I was, and, and they're not going to listen to this message. And then what is God's response to him? He right. says, I will send you away to the Gentiles. Now, did that mean that he didn't preach the gospel to the Jews later? No, he did. But primarily, we know he was called uh, to the Gentiles. And how do we know that? Look back at Ephesians 3. And that's what I want you to see. Look at what he says in verse 2 there. About the stewardship of, the, of grace and about the mystery that was revealed to him. It was given to him. He says, it was given to me for you. And so primarily in Ephesus, with that church, you know, there's primarily um, Gentiles there, right? There would have been Jews there too. But understanding uh, God's calling upon his life, and you go and read, um, you know, go and read Acts chapter 7 uh, later if you want to get some more details of, of that um, encounter. But we see that God revealed this mystery. And also that he had a work that he appointed for Paul to do. And so we'll talk more about the stewardship specifically. But we've already talked about it some because we're on the heels of the building of the foundation through the prophets and the apostles. So Paul was an apostle, right? We talked about this specific ministry, this separate, you know, special calling of this stewardship of being an apostle of, of Christ. And so he had a work that he set for Paul. So what does that look like in our lives, you guys? What's maybe some 
means of application here for us. If we believe in the gospel, then all the glory goes to the Lord, right? Because he put the pieces of the puzzle together. He revealed to us uh, this gospel, which was a mystery to us right up until the point that he revealed it, right? So it was a mystery until he saved me, and it's no longer a mystery. Now, there's certainly mysterious things, right? I don't know everything, but I know enough by faith to believe, and so that was revealed to me. But in that, if you're a believer, what also might be uh, some application here? Well, it's just like when you make a prayer and it gets answered, not in the way you think it would get the answer, but in his will. Okay, yeah, it, his will will be done, and that is appointed, yep, his will for all things, and so his will for you. Uh, even as Paul says there, Paul, there was work that God had for Paul. I mean, is, is there work that God has for you? Right? We, and we went over that in Ephesians 2, verse 10. It says, we are his workmanship created for good works that he had appointed for us before. So, yeah, if, if you're a believer, then God has, you know, work for you to do, just like he did Paul. Now, is it the same as he had Paul? No, it's not the same. And, it, and, and mine's not the same as Job's, and, you know, Lane's is not the same as Roseanne's. Um, you know, we, we have different giftedness and, and uh, abilities that the Lord has given to us for specific purposes, which are, to, to the growth point, his will. Does that make sense? So if we're going to follow God's will, put an application of some of, some of this, you know, what, what does that look like uh, in our lives? If God has work for you to do, what, what might be a good thing then for you to do? That's God. Yeah, and, and do what it is he's called you to do. Yeah, good. What do you want? That's right, because like, like Sky said, preaching the gospel, evangelizing, right? We know that every believer is called to that. But then there's also things in your life that you're called to. You're called to be a father and a husband. You're called to be a wife and a mother. Uh, you, you may be gifted in areas that you are called to serve, which you are. If, if you're a believer, you've been gifted in at least one area, and you're to give that gift to Christ and to his church in order that he would be more effective. So we want to try to understand and you know work together on what are the works that we as individuals are called to, but then also the works that we're called collectively to do, and how can we be most effective at doing those things, right? If if Roseanne's gifted in um, you know kids ministry, then it's probably not going to be most effective if we stick her up on the praise team and have her playing piano, right? We should probably have someone that's gifted in that. Does that make sense? Plugging in. We want to plug people in, and, and we need to be. That's the, and don't take that as we. That's not my job, right, as a pastor. Now, it's certainly something I can help in. It, it's part of the job description. But we all need to be seeking to serve one another, right, and using our gifts for Does that make sense?
that that change in their life and they can see you, you're holding that little lamp. That little, it's, it's just a light. It's just, you know, but it's a, it's a, when you're out there in the ocean or you're coming in, you see a light. You know, I know that light. I know there's three lights and you see the head force because you know it's secure. And a lot of people will see that. And then when they get into the door, you hit them with the daylight. <laughs> uh, no, but I'm saying it's, it's true. This That's how I live the light. No, he said you want to be a better Christian and show an example of being. And some people just looking for it. Just a conversation with somebody. You could be having lunch with somebody. Says, oh, yeah, I do that. I will go this and do that. And you're going to say, man, I'll, I'll pray about it. People say, you know, what are you talking about? You know, because the options, the world speaks loud. The world is, is a big carnival. God's voice is soft, you know, and it's gentle. Mm. Good. Well, we, uh, we got close. We're four minutes over. Um, good. Yeah, uh, help us to, Lord, certainly apply these things, right? We, we talk about things, we come to Bible studies, we read our Bibles, we do those things, but again, it's it's not, you know, it's not going to be fully beneficial unless we're living these things out, you guys. Uh, you know, it's not just for head knowledge and, you know, notes and things that we can take and just to be smarter in, in God's Word. Um, it's, to, it's to flesh it out in our service, Lord, just to allow us to open our hearts and minds to be better stewards for you, God.